is we are running too late. Uh, I will, uh, Dr. Dr. Ramesh, you are uh, there, so can you start with your? Uh, yeah, sure. Oh, yeah, sure. I, yeah. You, uh, are you are able to play the video? Or? Yeah, so you please start with your second talk, sir. Yeah, so can can they play it? I think I've sent yeah, it already. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's the one on the screen. Then yeah, I yeah. go ahead and play it. Yeah. The talk of, my second talk of uh, this afternoon is going to be on artificial lungs. Uh, yes, um, the, the, this is uh, a topic that is uh, fairly close to my heart. I was involved in one aspect of the research, uh, but my idea today is to give you an overview of the areas in which research is going on and what is uh, really the ultimate goal or the ongoing goal uh, in developing an artificial lung. For that, we first have to understand what is lung failure. So this is a picture, so I'm sure some, most of you are familiar with this. this is somebody, uh, this is somebody with IPF, uh, was quite young. However, in addition to the gas exchange problem, this is a significant compliance problem. So the one aspect of uh, lung function is compliance and the other is gas exchange. So here you can see somebody with quite severe type 2 respiratory failure and uh, it is for patients who are suffering from either or both uh, of these conditions that we aim to make an artificial lung. So what is the current strategy? Uh, I think uh, all of you are familiar that the technology we use currently at the bedside to help patients, uh, uh, we use a hollow fiber membrane uh, oxygenator which is a evolution up from the uh, direct oxygenators, the bubble oxygenators uh, and the membrane oxygenators that were used uh, in cardiac surgery with roller pumps. Uh, this is uh, the current setup is a centrifugal pump with a hollow fiber membrane oxygenator. Uh, and uh, in this the air gas mixture, the oxygen air mixture is passed in through to the hollow fibers and the blood flows on top of that and the exchange takes place. You can see from this particular slide uh, that there are significant differences or limitations of this technology. You can look at the, the, the picture taken are both at 100 microns, uh, but you can see how vastly exquisitely structured is the natural lung and how thick the membrane is at that resolution or at that magnification. The surface area is significantly lower. And the peak exchange rate uh, of oxygen, uh, even at rest, uh, the, uh, is about five times better in a resting lung. And if you have uh, some of these super athletes, they can really take it up to about 7,000 mils a minute. So this goes to show, uh, show that the efficacy, although reasonable in supporting these patients, is not really equivalent to the normal physiological possibility. So therefore, if you want to produce a desired list or a wish list of what you want, the life expectancy of the oxygenator has to, or the gas exchange membrane has to increase significantly. It's kind of days or weeks now. Some of our, some of us uh, in our practice have pushed it up to months. But really, if you're going to look at long-term support as a lung assist device, it has to increase significantly. There are areas of maldistribution in the of the blood in the chamber, and this leads to clotting. And uh, therefore, uh, this with the overall synthetic interface, we have to give anticoagulation. So we want to do away with anticoagulation, or at least reduce it significantly, because one of the side effects is bleeding. Right now, you have this little port where you be air on top, and uh, that is that means that the oxygenator has to be kept in air and it's fixed in a particular position which means if the patient wants to ambulate, run, jump, uh, sleep, get up by himself, we need an oxygenator that will be able to adapt to variable positions, which is currently not possible. And right now, the gas flow is fixed by what the perfusionist sets it at. Uh, it's not physiologically responsible, uh, sorry, responsive. So the patient wants to, and we found this with awake ECMO, when the patient wants to exercise, you've got to change these parameters Otherwise, they tend to end up getting breathless. So, to be able to respond to the patient's needs is another uh, important desired effect of, a, of an artificial lung. 
Why all of this is important? Because it will help us then to truly ambulate the patient, um, either, either through a paracorporeal or intracorporeal device, and they're not ICU or bed bound. Well, where are the main area, current areas of research? Um, before we go on to that, let's take a moment to look at currently what is it that we want to achieve. We want to achieve this, this is an electron scanning electron microscope of a picture of a, of a alveolar capillary membrane. So there's the alveolar, alveolar epithelium, there's the endothelial uh, epithelium, which is the endothelium, and there's the supporting scaffold between the two. So really, all of these, these, these three have to be mimicked as close to nature as possible if we want to make a truly replaceable artificial organ. Uh, the uh, areas of research on the three main groups, bioengineered lung tissue, the site, the, we're going to take a look a little bit more in detail about each of that, but the basic scientific principle is that you have a scaffold on one side of which you create the alveolar epithelium and the other side the endothelium to create an alveolar capillary membrane. If you are able to do this entirely synthetically without any kind of stem cells or organic material, then you have to take recourse to the next area of research which is microfluidics. But realistically, most of the current research is a hybrid of the, of the above two. Um, Photocatalysis is one that I've been involved in from about 2005 uh, when we basically uh, take a nano thin film photocatalyst. We used titanium oxide and indium oxide, uh, doped with indium oxide and we used ultraviolet rays. So this uh, uses the energy of the ultraviolet rays to split the water molecule which is present in plasma and to give a ready source of oxygen to an RBC without any kind of a uh, membrane problem. Uh, so this was so this is the basis of the photocatalytic oxygenated lung. So the bioengineered lung uh, is basically one where you take the uh, lung from either a deceased donor or a live uh, donor or uh, animal and you take out uh, all of the cells, the process called decellularization uh, and then you re-implant the cells or rather you uh, repopulate the cells with stem cells from the patient uh, and once you have a fully functional lung you re-implant this. I want to draw your attention to a study um, from Japan uh, where they very elegantly done study where they took mice, uh, they took the lungs uh, out of the mice, they decellularized it, they took one lung out of the mice they decellularized that uh, and then they re-implanted, sorry, or re-populated uh, re it with uh, epithelial cells alone uh, from, from uh, uh, which they had grown and the epithelial cells with adipose stromal stem cells uh, to provide some kind of uh, better connective tissue uh, signals and then the two along with uh, fibroblast growth factor. So what they noticed was that the first group was very leaky and the one uh, which had the adiposal stromal cell cells was less leaky but when you gave additional growth factors it uh, kind of occluded the lumen produced pulmonary hypertension. The reason I put up this slide is to show that we need to find that sweet spot whereby we are able to repopulate uh, accurately without either too leaky uh, an endothelium or epithelium or too, or too um, uh, rigid a structure that increases pulmonary hypertension. So that's the goal currently. Uh, this is a paper that is recently published from the lab that I am associated with in IIT Madras. I was not involved directly in this, this research, but they are developing uh, a membrane uh, in the micro, with, as a microfluidic device. Um, so the flow changes in a microfluidic uh, construct is very different from a macrofluidic. So the problems with shear stress and um, hemolysis will be, is believed to be significantly less. Of course, this may form the basis of a new kind of oxygenator for the ECMO of the future. Photocatalytic lung, in 2006-2007, we published in SIO, uh, Professor Subramaniam uh, and I uh, were the main people who did this. Uh, Professor Subramaniam is a thin film uh, semiconductor physicist at IIT Madras, he's since retired. So we showed this in, in, in a static uh, construct, we were able to show reasonable oxygenation. 
it took us a good uh, another seven years before we could uh, do it in a dynamic setup. So we set this up similar to an ECMO. So instead of uh, um, oxygen or air, we gave a mixture of oxygen nitrogen. We were able to control the concentration so as to produce a control level of deoxygenation. And in the photocatalytic cell, you can see that the blood is getting oxygenated. Uh, so th these were temperature, pressure, con uh, pH control studies. So we demonstrated in 2015, uh, sorry, 2014, that it was possible to get over a four-hour period a five percent increase. Now this is not of clinical value in terms of efficacy, but it showed that the proof of concept that this was a way in which you could oxygenate blood. Uh, but until any one of these provides a solution, and it will provide a solution, it's just a matter of time. We have uh, lung transplants, and I want to thank the organizers for uh, providing the time uh, for this uh, uh, very interesting, or at least a topic that I find personally interesting. I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Very Yeah. Any questions? So, Dr. Paul, uh, what do you feel? How, how much time it will take to have a better oxygenator? Uh, a better oxygenator, I think, uh, not too long. I think uh, the microfluidics uh, constructs uh, should be able to uh, improve uh, at least the life uh, uh, life expectancy as well as the uh, anticoagulation profile significantly within the next few years. That I think is, uh, shouldn't be a problem. Uh, the great bioengineered lungs, very difficult to say, there have been great advances, but I think as an adjunct to probably damaged donor lungs, which are not usable currently, uh, some form of improved uh, lung, uh, I mean donor lungs uh, that can be kept uh, alive for a longer period of time and possibly even reduce the primary graft dysfunction is a possibility in the in the foreseeable future. Difficult to put a number, but probably about five years, I would say, within five years. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we are just running short of time, so uh, uh, we will start the next talk. Uh, the next talk is uh, by Dr. Sundar. Post lung transplant. The next talk is by Dr. Sundar. Post lung transplant techno indications and outcomes. Sir has already given a talk uh, just before, so I won't introduce him again. Can you hear me, Dr. Sula? I believe it's a recorded. Uh, I have already sent the recording. Yeah, yes, and sir. We, we, are, we are starting it, sir. We are playing action. Nice. Yeah. Good day to you all. I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk on uh, post lung transplant ECMO the indications and the outcomes. To give an overview, I will talk about the types of post-transplant ECMO in terms of timing of institution of ECMO and in terms of the configuration of the ECMO circuit. Talk about indications and outcomes and discuss briefly our data as regards post-lung transplant ECMO. So when you look at the types of post-lung transplant ECMO, based on timing, you have two categories. The more common one is the unplanned emergent institution of ECMO due to graft failure, most often due to primary graft dysfunction. The next is a technique described by the Hanover group, which is a planned continuation of intraoperative ECMO into the postoperative period in cases of idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension, which I'll talk about a little later. As regards the configuration of the ECMO circuit, uh, most often uh, it is a VV ECMO to provide lung support. Again, it may be a VV or a VA ECMO based on the clinical scenario and clinical need. If cardiac support is needed as well, then it would be a VA ECMO. Most often it is a peripheral ECMO configuration and in the presence of <clears throat> a lung failure and VA echo has been used, there may well be a requirement to institute another 
cannula in the vein and connect it to the return cannula, a VAV configuration to deal with hypoperfusion of the upper limb because of poorly functioning lungs, what is known as the Harlequin syndrome. Now, the indication for ECMO post transplant, the main indication is salvage therapy of a pressure plant. Organs are scarce, and once you get it, we do all what we can to salvage it. And of course, as a result, it could also be a life saving procedure. Most commonly, it is used uh, when primary graft dysfunction grade 3 happens after lung transplant. Other indications include pneumonia, sepsis, rejection, rarely hemoptysis. So, primary graft dysfunction. Now, after transplant, once the clamp was removed, if the lung fails to function well, and it is not due to infection, rejection, heart failure, or known causes, it is called a primary graft dysfunction, again signifying the exact cause, uh, cause is not known. So, in 2016, the International Society of Heart Lung Transplantation published a consensus group statement regarding the definition and grading of primary graft dysfunction, as you can see there. It starts from grade zero to grade three, which is the most severe, where you have changes on the X-ray along with a low PF ratio of less than 200. So, as I told earlier, primary graft dysfunction most often occurs within the first 72 hours of implantation. Grade 1 and grade 2, which are the minor and moderate varieties of primary graft dysfunction, often respond to conservative measures such as, you know, prolonged ventilation, increasing the feed, trying to recruit more alveoli, diuresis and fluid management, uh, the use of nitric oxide and probably sildenafil and Now, failing all these measures, if the PGD progresses to grade 3, with a virtual whiteout of the lung and falling PF ratio, one needs to consider instituting ECMO, most often a peripheral ECMO. Rarely, uh, soon after the move of the clamp, we could have PGD while in theater. Now, this is an article published in the Annals of Cardiothoracic Surgery in 2019, where they looked at the outcomes and risk factors. If you look on the left side of the kaplan Meyer curve, the upper curve is those who had no post-transplant ECMO and the one below which shows an inferior outcome is those who had ECMO. On the right side, it is the same cohort of patients, but the graphs are virtually similar because this takes into account only a conditional three-month survival after ECMO. This obviously tells us that the major attrition after ECMO happens in the first three months, and if we were to take care of patients there, we could improve survival. Mm -hmm. Now, another paper in the Journal of Thoracic uh, Diseases in 2018 uh, about extracorporeal support during and after lung transplant, they looked at many series and published a series of um, patients, and one report reported a survival of 41% one year for graph failure. However, they were the ones who reported a dismal 3% survival when the post transplant ECMO was used for sepsis or pneumonia. This is the various series uh, reported by the paper I just mentioned earlier. As you can see, except the last, which was reported in 2018, the rest of all the papers are more than 10 years old. So the survival for the last is about 62% at 6 months, whereas the ones earlier were much lower. This obviously shows improvement in care of the patient, improved technology, and we do hope to have further improved results down the line in the future. Now, regarding timing of institution of ECMO, once we have confirmed PGD and it is severe, no time should be spent. Early institution of ECMO after lung transplant improves outcomes. This was a paper submitted quite early in 2007 in the Journal of Heart and Lung Transplant, where in their series of 297 patients, eight patients needed ECMO. But the sooner the patients were initiated on ECMO, the outcomes were better. A more recent paper looking at a much larger cohort, a 
published in the Journal of Heart Lung Transplant in 2018, they looked at patients in the UNOS database. Uh, at 200, 2001 patients, out of which 107 required ECMO, which is roughly 5.1%, and the risk factors they identified for requirement of ECMO post-transplant would be those who had ECMO pre-transplant, prolonged ischemic time of the donor organs, increased recipient age, and most importantly, patients who had pulmonary hypertension as their primary diagnosis. Now, the same paper shows the kaplan meyer curve where you find a near horizontal line showing a good survival in patients who needed no echo. But obviously, this is looking only at six months duration, whereas those requiring echo fall much lower. Planned extension of ECMO postoperatively. As I mentioned earlier, the Hanover group popularized this mainly in patients with idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension. Now, in such patients, they did that double lung transplant with intraoperative use of ECMO. On the completion of ECMO, they kept, they developed an AV bridge and kept the ECMO circuit circulating. They removed the central pipes, inserted peripheral cannula in the femoral artery, femoral vein, and reconnected to the ECMO circuit. And what they found was for a given period of time, those patients with ECMO enjoyed a superior survival of 100% and 96% at three months and one year. However, those patients with idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension who did not have this planned extension postoperatively had much inferior survival rates. Now, the, 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 the theory behind use of postoperative ECMO in a planned manner is that in cases with idiopathic pulmonary artery hypertension where the pulmonary vascular resistance is so high, the heart, the left ventricle in particular, is used to a very small preload, very little amount of blood get past the high PVR of the disease lung, no matter how high the right ventricle generates its pressure. Now, as a result of a chronically underfilled LV, the LVV models and the cavity becomes small, Come a successful double lung transplant, there is a luxuriant flow across the lung because of the low PVR of the new lungs and the left ventricular cavity is unable to cope with a sudden gush and increase of preload. And left ventricular failure and pulmonary edema sets in and also predisposes to primary graft dysfunction. Now, to mitigate this, uh, these uh, authors plan on using a continuation of echo for a few days in the post-operative period in the ICU. They had a median period of uh, ECMO run for about five, five days, ranging from four to eight days. And they found that was enough time to help the LV accommodate gradually more volume and chest. And they were able to separate the patients from ECMO post-operatively with good results. Coming to our unit data, this is a slide I put across in my previous presentation as well, which lists the number of organs that we transplanted and in what configuration heart, combined heart and lung, heart, lung, uh, kidney, heart and liver, double lung and single lung transplant. Now, as regards post-transplant ECMO, we had 11 patients, 10 were for PGD and one was for massive hemoptysis and cardiac arrest. Of those for PGD, required PGD within the first 72 hours, we were able to separate nine from ECMO, however, only eight survived. Now, as regards the patient with massive hemoptysis and cardiac arrest, he was a patient with COVID, uh, ARDS, who had a long period of ECMO, and following that, we managed to get him off ECMO, bridged him off to recovery, but that left him in a chronic respiratory failure. And so he was waited, listed for a transplantation, although we were able to manage him with a non-invasive ventilation. After this transplant, we were able to separate him from ECMO. Given the uh, myopathy, he required prolonged ventilation through a tracheostomy. He was discharged home with home nursing. Sadly, he developed a massive hemoptysis at home. He was resuscitated, brought to the hospital, 
had a CT scanner to find and see if you could find the reason for the bleed. We were suspecting a major pulmonary bronchial or bronchovascular fistula. That wasn't the case. And while we were shifting him off the CT scanner table, he developed a cardiac arrest in the CT scanner where he had a cardiac massage for 45 minutes and we instituted a VA ECMO in the cat lab. We managed to get him off. We sucked the lungs dry. We found the bleeder in the right lung, bronchus beyond the anastomosis, which was cauterized using organ autocoagulation. And we were able to separate him off ECMO. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, sir. Um, Inviting me to give this talk off. That was a fantastic talk. Uh, there's a couple of questions from the audience, if you may. Yes, sir. Dr. Sundar, thank you. This is Dr. Poonam. Thanks again for a very nice lecture on uh, indications for ECMO post lung transplant. I just want to ask two small questions. Uh, when you come off lung transplant, you mentioned PGD as one of the main indications for which you would put an ECMO. What are some cardiac or non-cardiac conditions where you would not contemplate ECMO in despite of PGD? There are some conditions like uh, we saw in one of our lung transplants, a mild amount of AR. Now that, that sometimes may be a deterrent to put the patient on ECMO. Would you consider an aortic insufficiency as a deterrent? If it is more than mild in your PGD patients post lung transplant, and do you have some other indications when ECMO despite PGD should not be done? Yes, yes. Uh, thank you for your question. Now, now, now that is a, a challenging situation to be in. Uh, as you will agree with me, all lung transplant patients need to be assessed very, very carefully, and any valvular lesions should have been ideally picked up. Uh, if it is going to be a mild degree of AR, um, and I'm talking in terms of only VA ECMO. VB ECMO is usually the ECMO we you do for PGD, where only respiratory support is needed. But if a central uh, support is needed, obviously a severe AR is going to be a problem. And if you are being as invasive as going to do an ECMO on a patient who had a precious graft, then no attempt should be avoided. Uh, to save the patient, and at that point, you know, one would have to fix the aortic path. Now, that I think would be a very rare scenario, but that has to be in consideration. But then, if the patient had a significant AR before the operation, we would have had to assess him carefully for the choice of operation, perhaps consider the heart and double lung as opposed to a double lung operation. Thank you. And what is the state of the patient once you come off ECMO? How, how do you decide that this patient, besides the weaning criteria to come off ECMO, what lung parameters do you see and decide that, okay, now I can wean off my ECMO? Sometimes 14 yes. days, sometimes 5 days, uh, ECMO period can be varying in the post-transplanting. Yes. Since the most common indication for ECMO is PGD, which occurs within 72 hours, the great majority tend to resolve within five to six days time. And the parameters to come off ECMO would be pretty much the same parameters for any other condition. We try using the oxy test. We try to find out what uh, path, what contribution the native lung is offering for uh, oxygenation as opposed to the membrane lung. And as you find there are cases of lung recovery in terms of improvement in chest X-ray, in terms of improvement in tidal volume, the lung protective ventilation on ECMO would be what we all agree would be a pressure control ventilation. Now, initial periods of PGD when we put the ECMO for a given control pressure, we will have tidal volumes of only 30, 40. Over the period of time, when the tidal volume increases to 150, 200, 250, there is an improvement in the uh, X-ray and gas exchange, we then start thinking of ECMO. It's a very good question because in transplant patients, they are immunosuppressed. You don't want to stay on ECMO longer than you. And this is how we do it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Um, since we're running short of time, I think uh, we end this talk here. Thank you very much once again. Thank you. Thank you, sir. My Thank pleasure. You. Thank you, Dr. Sundar. Yes, sir. Very good afternoon. We have our next speaker, Dr. Z.S. Meherwal.
He is the executive director and head cardiovascular surgery, heart transplantation, and VAD program at Fortis Escorts Heart Institute, Delhi. A lot of achievements to his credit. Uh, the few awards I will name them. He has been given the award by the Sri A. T. J. Abdul Kalam. He has been listed in the Linka Book of Records for performing a CRPG <coughs> on a 94-year-old man and was honored the best transplant surgeon by Medical Trip India uh, in February 2020. I welcome you, sir. Good afternoon, uh, friends. Let me first thank the organizing team for inviting me for this very important conference. I must also apologize for not being present here physically due to some commitments in Delhi. I'll be briefly speaking on the overview of cardiac assist devices. <coughs> the cardiac assist devices is basically a mechanical device which increases the forward cardiac output in patients with heart failure. These therapies they consist of ventricular assist devices and artificial heart which augment or replace the ventricle. And based on which ventricle we support, we classify them into the left ventricular assist devices, the right ventricular assist devices, and the biventricular assist devices. So LVAD, RVAD, and YVAD. Based on the uh, duration of support, we can classify these uh, devices into the short term, which are used for hours, days, sometimes for weeks the long-term devices which are used for months to years. These devices are primarily used in patients who have heart failure and we all know that heart failure is a serious disease. These are the figures from the United States and the reason why we quote the figures from the United States because the data from our country is not very accurate but we can always extrapolate the numbers in our country based on these figures. In the United States, there are about 6.2 million adults who have heart failure, and out of these, almost 10% have advanced heart failure. And the heart failure certainly is a very serious disease. In 2017, there were about 352,000 deaths in the United States because of heart failure. The numbers are huge in our country as well. The short-term cardiac assist devices or the ventricular assist devices are indicated in patients who present to us with cardiogenic shock and the two important causes of cardiogenic shock are acute myocardial infarction and acute myocarditis. We use uh, the cardiac assist devices also in the operating theatre post cardiotomy and we can't come off cardiopulmonary bypass and we want to support the ventricle temporarily. The short term assist devices are being used quite frequently now in high risk cardiac interventions, both the coronary interventions as well as the valve interventions. And finally, in some patients post cardiac transplant, we needed the short term ventricular assist devices to support primarily the right ventricle. <clears throat> According to the technique of insertion, we can uh, classify the short term devices into percutaneous, which can be inserted through percutaneous approach. And the commonly used devices include Impeller 2.5 and Impeller RP, the tandem heart, and protect drone and acne. The short term devices which need surgical technique include Centimac, Impeller 5, and Acro. These are uh, some of the commonly used percutaneous temporary security support options for the left ventricle as well as for the right ventricle. The intraoptic balloon pump is a very commonly used uh, uh, temporary security support device, but it provides a limited uh, cardiac output. And increase the cardiac output to a limited uh, degree in these patients, and the right ventricle is not supported directly 
but to some extent indirectly. The devices which significantly increase the cardiac output include impeller, tendon heart, and ECMO. For the right ventricle, the devices which use include impeller RP, tendon heart protect glue, and ECMO. The impeller 2.5 and impeller 5 are uh, very commonly used uh, short-term uh, cardiac assist devices, primarily in the uh, in the cath lab. It's <coughs> primarily are used for the left ventricular support. The 2.5 can be inserted with the femoral artery through a cutaneous approach, while the impeller 5 needs a surgical cut down and is inserted either through the femoral artery or axillary artery. And it provides 2.5 and 5 liters of flow uh, respectively. It has been approved for up to 6 hours of use by the FDA. The tendon heart is another uh, temporary separate support device which again supports the left ventricle. The cannulas are inserted percutaneously into the femoral artery and into the femoral vein across the interatrial septum into the left atrium. It provides up to 5 liters of flow and can be used up to 14 days. <coughs> Centrimag is a very uh, commonly used uh, device in the, in the cardiac surgical unit. It can be used both for the left ventricle as well as the right ventricle support. The cannula are typically inserted via midline sternotomy and it can be lower up to 10 liters of flow and it can be used for up to 30 days. ACMO is a very commonly used uh, device and in fact uh, there is a uh, discussion on all the aspects of ACMO and in this conference and ACMO certainly uh, became a household name uh, during the COVID pandemic. I won't go into the details but it can be inserted to the peripheral uh, cannulations or it can be, can be used to the uh, central in relations into the right atrium and the aorta. The long-term long devices <coughs> evolved uh, over the last many decades from first generation devices which were pulsatized large bulky devices and they were associated with a lot of uh, comorbidities and complications. The second generation devices which were continuous flow axial flow devices so they currently use third generation devices, which are continuous flow and centrifugal devices. So these pumps uh, can be uh, either axial pumps or they can be the centrifugal pumps. The uh, heartbeat tube uh, is an example of the uh, continuous flow uh, axial pump, and heartbeat three uh, is the example of a continuous flow a centrifugal pump. Heartbeat 2 uh, has the uh, largest uh, published data in the second generation devices and it has shown excellent results. The Heartbeat HVAC uh, is a third generation uh, centrifugal pump and it has been discontinued uh, recently. The Heartbeat 3 again is a third generation continuous flow uh, magnetically levitated device and currently is the most commonly used uh, long-term rat in practice. So the two most commonly uh, used when pressing devices used to be heart rate 3 device, the heart rate device, and the heart rate device has been removed from the market in June 2021 and it is no longer available or important. The, there are some other devices as well including the Jarvi, but they are used to limit a limited extent. Uh, currently, the Jarvik is being uh, marketed in many other countries uh, besides US also. The hardware 3, which is the uh, most commonly used third generation pump right now, is basically uh, surgically implanted uh, in, the, in parallel with the native left ventricle. It has an intro cannula which is inserted into the left ventricle. It is connected to the pump. The pump is disconnected to the out of the orphan graft, this pump is connected to the controller through this dry line and the controller is then connected to two batteries. The controller stores all the data and controls all the functions 
of the, of the womb. And after implantation of the heartbeat 3, the patient can do all routine activities at home as well as at work. Primarily, these uh, long term uh, separate support devices are used uh, for two indications one, the breast transplantation, which is probably one of the most common, and it supports the patient until transplantation. And second is the gestational therapy, which is basically the long term for patients who are ineligible for transplant, but otherwise they have a good life expectancy. But the breast recovery, again, now uh, is one of the uh, very common indications for these devices. This is uh, one of our first patients uh, uh, of heart rate 2 when we started our transplant and the LVI program about 10 years back. And this patient actually uh, uh, celebrated his 81st birthday uh, in US. He stays uh, in US about six months with his daughter, and that's the time he stays in India and is having a uh, excellent life. The hemodynamics of uh, LVAD is uh, typical of a known pulsatile, uh, known pulsatile flow. And why I'm showing this because this is important uh, to know for the general physicians that they can't uh, feel the pulse of these patients. In fact, one of our patients who had received HVAD uh, landed in a local hospital in an unconscious state. And the, uh, the emergency doctor thought that, uh, that because the patient was pulseless, that patient had a cardiac arrest and started the, the cardiac resuscitation. In fact, this patient had a stroke. By the time he was, uh, he was lifted to our hospital, the patient had suffered an irreversible brain damage. The, uh, the echo, I think, is a very uh, important uh, uh, tool in the operating theater to know not only the position of the inflow cannula, but also to look at the left ventricle, right ventricle, and many other uh, parameters. Long-term uh, ventricle devices certainly are associated with significant uh, adverse events, and these include infection, which is primarily uh, through the dry line, and these are mechanical pumps. The patient has to be on long-term anticoagulation and pump thrombosis and thrombomobile complications, including stroke, are important uh, complications in the long term. And in some patients, they get right ventricular failure. The first long term survival after this uh, LVAD was published more than 20 years back, comparing the medical management with the, uh, with the heart rate 2 as the destination therapy. And as you can see, at two years, the survival in medical management patients was 8% versus 63% in patients who received heart rate 2. A few years back, the Momentum 3 trial was, was published, which compared the two-year uh, data of the, of the heart rate 2 versus uh, heart rate 3. And heart rate 3 certainly showed much better results as compared to the heart rate 2. Currently, uh, most of the, uh, the long-term VATs are continuous flow pumps, which account for almost 100% of the LVADs uh, after 2010. The survival is improving uh, over, over time, and it is 83%, 75%, and 61% at 1, 3, and 5 years, and this is improving uh, every year. The quality of life in majority of these patients is good. Uh, this is a, one of our patients, about uh, six years post, post LVAD, uh, living an absolutely normal life. Uh, he travels uh, he long distances, he uh, loves driving cars, and uh, is, is living an absolutely normal life. And as I mentioned, there are certainly a uh, lot, uh, lot of associated long-term complications. So there are a lot of future developments uh, focused on improving the hemocompatibility of these devices. To reduce thrombotic and bleeding events. The software algorithms are being developed which will allow the pulsatility, which is parallel to the patient's functional needs. Creation of smaller devices which can be inserted through less imaging procedures with a faster recovery. And very importantly, development of totally implantable designs which can use wireless energy transfer system so that we can get rid of the dry line and can avoid 
infection, which is an important complication of these devices. I thank you very much, and I wish all of you enjoy this conference and benefit from this ending program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. This was the last talk of this session. I request you to join us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Continue with the next session. So, bye.